Hello and welcome to China Tonight. I'm Stan Grant. On the program, Lost in Translation, how cultural understanding impacts use of language. And how do you keep a hungry ghost satisfied? By offering all these ghosts and spirits with food to make them hungry, ghosts become happy ghosts so that, you know, we will not be cursed. But first, the news. And joining me is Samuel Yang. Hi, Sam. Hi, Stan. I thought I might do the news in Mandarin today, if that works for you. Certainly does for me. Now, it was among the worst hit provinces during China's record heat wave, but the bad news just keeps coming for people in Sichuan. 是的 ，Stan， 上周四川省发生了六点八级地震，至少八十六人遇难，数十人失联。这是四川省自二零一七年以来发生的最大的地震，摧毁了镇中泸定县附近的部分道路和建筑，同时数百人因此受伤。救援人员正全力开展抢险工作。人员住宿比较分散，而且很多在高山密林当中，坡度比较陡。现在时间非常紧迫。但凡有一线希望，我们争分夺秒去展开搜救。四川省的省会成都震感明显，地震发生的时候，两千一百万居民仍处于疫情的封城状态。目前，官方已宣布无期限延长该市的疫情防控措施。当地的封城本该在上周三就结束，但地方官员表示，疫情在某些地区仍有传播的风险。Looking externally now, Russia and China's warming ties could get a further boost next week. 中国国家主席习近平和俄罗斯总统普京即将会面，这预示着自俄罗斯入侵乌克兰以来，两人的首次面对面会谈。消息传来之际，正值中共高层领导力战书，在弗拉迪沃斯托克会见俄罗斯总统普京。据俄罗斯官方表示，力战书告诉俄罗斯官员，尤其在乌克兰的局势上，中国理解并支持俄罗斯。普京告诉媒体记者，他希望在本周末与乌兹别克斯坦举行的上合组织峰会期间与习近平会面。Our strategic partnership is developing and is developing successfully. The trade turnover is growing. Last year, it grew significantly by 36 percent. 如果会面成功举行，这将是习近平自新冠疫情开始以来首次离开中国。And there's also been a remarkable story of survival out of China this week. 没错，一名男子乘氢气球不慎被大风吹走，两天以后成功生还。原因是这名胡姓男子在乘坐氢气球踩松塔的时候，氢气球的绳索没有系牢。另外一个和他一起工作的男子当时设法跳到了安全地带，但胡先生却漂流了三百多公里，最后在俄罗斯边境附近安全着陆。胡先生基本上安然无恙，但保险起见，随后他被送往了医院。再拖，再拖一天。也就够呛了，我都要要放弃了，没有他们就没有我。今天，下次他要踩松塔的时候，可能需要想想新的办法了。Stan might be a good idea. And the Mid Autumn Festival took place on Saturday. 中秋节呀，是春节之外最重要的农历节日。中国以及部分亚洲国家的民众在这一天和家人欢聚一堂，共度佳节。中秋恰逢丰收的时节，人们认为这一天的月亮是最亮、最圆的。这不，今晚中国秀与糕点师 Steve 和 Lucy 聊了一下中秋的意义。The traditional mooncake we always have either red bean or white lotus paste, and then with a big duck yolk inside. I think mooncakes around there for three thousand years, so it's very traditional Chinese pastry. It's a heavy and rich uh, pastry. Right now, it's the Mid Autumn Festival. Every Mid Autumn Festival, we have mooncakes. Autumn Festival is following the Lunar New Year, it's fifth of the month. So that's the harvest moon. So you can see the dark yolk inside the mooncake is like a, like full moon. Normally, people choose the best mooncakes and they give to the people they cherish. Before bakery,、uh, I was a designer. I have a bachelor degree and a master degree in animation. I did my doctor degree in aerospace engineering. I used to work in German Aerospace Center in Stuttgart, and then now I'm like next to the oven in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> My wife and her mom start small business 
from home and then from there all the customers keep ordering without stop for the last six years. After I saw the customers face, they feel very happy. I think, okay, I think that's the meaning for me. <laughs> This is one of the seasons everyone is looking forward. It's not about only eating and sharing the mooncakes. It's like for say thank you and sharing yeah, the happy moment. This is the time to remind you a lot of people love you and you love a lot of people. You say thank you to them. We gave you mooncakes to say love to our loved ones. The Mid-Autumn Festival celebrations follow Ghost Month in the Chinese calendar, marked with another festival, that of the Hungry Ghost. It's a period when the dead are believed to return to the realm of the living and are given offerings to keep them satisfied. It's just one way the dead are mourned in Chinese culture. And while traditions around death remain strong, modernity is having an impact. Annie Louie explains. Did you know that every year during the seventh month of the lunar calendar, the gates of hell burst open, unleashing ghosts who roam the earth? They wander the streets looking for entertainment, visiting living relatives, all hunger inducing work. So, in the middle of the month, a festival is held to give them food and other offerings. So what we do is um, we believe that by offering all these ghosts and spirits with food and feed them with good food and wine, you know, uh, to make them hungry ghosts become happy ghosts so that, you know, we will not be cursed. Not only do they get hungry, but it turns out spirits and ghosts can be a bit materialistic. As part of this festival, people are burning paper money, houses and even cars to ensure that their ancestors are happy in the afterlife. Looking after ancestors on the other side is important to many in China. Attitudes towards death are likely to have been shaped by folklore and the three major religions of Taoism, Confucianism and Buddhism. It is widely believed that when a person dies, they become a spirit. They pass on into the afterlife, but they also stick around to look after living relatives. During the Shang Dynasty, it was believed that whatever happened in their life in this world, whether good or bad, was at least influenced, if not entirely, controlled by ancestors' actions. And therefore, they worshipped ancestors. So this tradition continued throughout the Chinese history. That means the dead are also very important to the living. Two main ideas, ancestor worship, and making sure your loved ones would have a happy life next stage are very important to Chinese culture. But despite ancestor worship being widely practiced, death is still very much a taboo topic. It is a very difficult conversation for most of the Chinese people or Asian um, uh, migrants to talk about. Like other languages, there are Chinese phrases used to avoid talking about death directly. If someone has died, you can also say ta guo chu, which means they pass through. At the same time, there are some distinctly Chinese superstitions to avoid bringing death upon yourself or your family, like never putting your chopsticks vertically into a bowl of rice because it resembles incense that you use to pray for the dead. I wasn't actually going to do it. How am I going to eat this? In some parts of China, people believe you have to be married to enter the afterlife too. Ghost marriages are a tradition dating back thousands of years. A ceremony is held for two deceased people who very likely never met each other, all so they can have company in the afterlife. The main reason behind this practice, which is throughout Chinese history, was the assurance of a happy life for the deceased who died too young. If you go to the Asian part of a cemetery in Australia, you'll see many graves are made to look like houses. Some can accommodate several family members, like these here at Songhe Sinyuan in Melbourne's east. In Chinese we say xiao, it's, it's that sense of duty, sense of responsibility that the, the living carries forever. Often the plots and headstones are purchased years in advance. And while most in Australia are accustomed to the business side of funerals, the industry of death is new to much of China, and it's changing how death is perceived. It's 
you uh, help somebody in your extended family with a funeral, that's a moral thing to do. But in the urban setting, if you are helping strangers with their funerals for money, that sort of crosses this kind of uncomfortable line. Professor Andrew Kipnis is an anthropologist who has studied the impact of urban development on Chinese funeral practices. There's actually more taboo of death in urban societies than rural societies, and I think it has something to do with uh, being a society of strangers. And so your dead ancestors are okay, but dead strangers are scary. They can be like ghosts. And those who work with the dead are shunned. They're not your relatives who are helping you out with funerals, but they're weird people who work in this ghastly occupation and they have trouble finding spouses. They often marry each other. They often lie about what their occupation is. Space in China is becoming increasingly scarce too, especially in big cities. In some areas, cremation is compulsory and structures containing ashes can be 20 storeys high. So at each level, you could have hundreds or maybe even thousands of boxes. And so it's kind of like living in a high rise apartment, right? Which is of course the experience of many urban people in Chinese cities anyway. <sighs> this world and the afterlife sounds like it's got a lot in common. I'm gonna need money, food, a house, or at least an apartment in a high rise building, a car, and a partner. But I do have Three billion fake dollars. I reckon that's enough. Well, it can buy you something in the afterlife at least. Annie Louie joins me now. Annie, you used to work in a funeral home, is that right? Yeah, I did. I think my curiosity started with my own father's funeral about seven years ago and there were so many traditions that I didn't really understand. There was a lot of secrecy around the rituals. So after that, I, it wasn't so scary to me anymore since I'd watched my family go through it and I ended up working at a funeral home and I got a lot out of helping other people. But through doing this story, I learned more about some of those things that were taboo. Like my mum didn't want me working there because she thought that I would never find a partner. So I thought mm. this was some kind of superstitious curse. But according to the professor that you just saw, it's more of a practical thing. They think that we'd be shunned from society and never be able to fit in. Well, you're welcome here at least, <laughs> regardless of your past. Uh, perhaps the best example though of items being left behind, and we saw the money and houses and cars, but terracotta warriors. Yes, we've all heard about the terracotta warriors, but what you might not know is that they were discovered in 1974 and there's thousands of them, like up to 8,000 of these figures that are supposed to protect the first emperor of the Qin dynasty. And it just shows that that kind of making a home in the afterlife is very important and the more realistic, the better. So that's why some of the effigies that we saw, like paper money, paper houses, they have to be really real so that the ancestors can be provided with a safe afterlife. Thank you, Annie. Thanks, Dan. Always a pleasure. Now for what's making news on the platforms the people themselves use, Weibo and WeChat. <laughs> Sam, Queen Elizabeth II is being mourned in Hong Kong. Sangarinyatinchi 微博上的用户纷纷向女王致敬，同时发了一些女王在1968年到访中国时的照片。她是第一位访问中国的英国元首。一条微博留言写道：“老太太所亲历见证的历史可以算是人类近代以来世界格局变化最激荡的一段了。
She asked me what meat I wanted, ham or turkey. I said, what's the difference? She was like, ha ha ha, to tell it doesn't know what are ham and turkey. Her mom also laughed and explained it like she was teaching a toddler. Ham is unk unk, turkey is cluck cluck cluck. You know what, girls? I just didn't know the vocabulary. It's not that I'm too stupid to recognize animals. <laughs> so, Sam, what was the point she was trying to make? Did it resonate with you? It did, Stan. She's describing how difficult it is to become truly fluent in a second language and how those efforts can be easily dismissed. So, that's pretty good. <laughs> yes, yeah. Thanks, Dan. Professor Jing Han is Director of the Institute for Australia and Chinese Arts and Culture at Western Sydney University and a leading expert in translating Chinese language and culture. She also heads up the subtitling unit at SBS and has translated more than 300 Chinese films and TV programs for Australian audiences, including the smash hit If You Are The One. I spoke to her earlier. Jing Han, thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you, Stan. Now, there's a little story I know about you, and this may tell us a lot about how we understand words and translation. You first came to Australia, and you were standing outside, and there was a no-standing sign. But what did that mean to you? That's a very good question, and that's a very good uh, story to start with. I came in 1988, and back then in China, there was no private car, so uh, there was no such a thing as you drive by yourself. So when I saw that sign, no standing, I instantly related to pedestrian because there was no dif distinguished. So you know, thought you I couldn't thought, keep standing? Yes, so what because did you I do? thought the sign was for the pedestrian <laughs> and that was a bus stop. And I thought, because I understood English, so that's what I understood. And so no standing, what am I supposed to do? But this is the bus stop that I have to get on the bus to, to Sydney University. Yeah. And coincidentally, there was no one there. So you started walking up and down? Yes, <laughs> because I thought, you know, you can see that no, no one was there because they are asking not to be standing. So I thought, OK, I'll keep walking down and until the bus came and then I jumped into the bus. And, and that's an interesting story because it tells us that that translation is context. And so now as a translator, how do you take a word that may mean something in one language, translate it to another, but also understand context? That is so true. So you can see the mistake I make is also because I forgot about the target. The target is for the driver, mm. not for the pedestrian. So language to start with, I mean, people often say translation. Translation is actually not about funding equivalents because no, there are no equivalents without difference mm. and equivalence is not a replication. And what's the difficulty particularly when you're not just translating say from English to French or German but an entirely different tradition, a different written tradition. If you're translating from English to Chinese there are not going to be words that directly translate. Ne never actually. So translation is not about translate what is said, it's actually translate what is meant because even we speak the same language, we don't always mean what we say. So, you know, we speak in an ironical way, mm. we speak metaphorically, we also speak in an inferential way. For example, I say, do you watch Big Bang Theory? And you said, I never watch sitcom. Ah. So I need to understand. So you need to understand what I'm saying is not just this, That's but what right. does that mean? That's what right. is a sitcom? And exactly. What's interesting here, so if we're talking politically, and this is where yes. things can get very difficult, we have an example where, for instance, the Chinese embassy presented, apparently, a list of what was seen as demands for what Australia should acquiesce to, 14 demands. Are they or are they requests? How would that be interpreted in Chinese? Yes, you touch on a very important point because uh, translation especially involves a political content and then the sensitivities is definitely there and the precision is very important. Chinese language is very different from English in the expression, especially in the way we speak. You know, for example, we say, uh, uh, if what you translate, you yes, exactly. But that's not in English what you want because in English you say what you want is quite rude and abrupt. But in Chinese, it's a perfect way. It's, it's not the same. So, you know, if you translate into English, you should translate, what would you like? And that would be what the Chinese meant. And this can get difficult, can't it, if we're dealing at a politically sensitive time right now, 
where there is a great deal of confrontation. And one of the issues is the inability to find a language to speak to each other, to find a diplomatic language, to talk through these hardening differences. How much more difficult is that when you're not actually speaking the same language oh, and you're having to translate? Huge difference because the first requirement is really proficiency in the language because to understand what is meant requires the language proficiency, the knowledge of the language you translate from. And then you also need to have understanding of the contextual information. And then you have to register the cognitive environment of your target language. Mm. So without understanding much of the uh, source language, and then you think that you can translate it, you will definitely get it wrong. In, in your own work, one of the things that you do is translate Australian works of literature, because that's what you studied, into Mandarin, into Chinese. How do you approach that when you're dealing with idioms or when you're dealing with even culturally specific language within English? I know that one of the texts that you translated was Melissa Lukashenko, an Indigenous writer, and her book Too Much Lip, um, which is using a lot of Aboriginal English and Aboriginal idiom. How do you approach something when you're getting down to that granular level? Yes. That's another very important uh, challenge that you, you, you face is, uh, first of all, you do need to understand the origin language. That's Melissa Lukashenko's language, which, as you mentioned, is very colloquial, uh, Australia and also very colloquial indigenous language. So it's really thorough understanding every aspect I cover. And then I think how Chinese would say in the same context or about the same issue or about the same thing and then form with the Chinese way of seeing it. Do, do you see your work really as being able to bring people together? One of the things you said earlier was that you're not doing a literal translation, but you're trying to give a meaning or a feeling of the meaning. Do you see this work as actually connecting people as much as words? Absolutely. I, I think the reason why If You Are The One is so popular in Australia people love that show is because they feel like they can relate to Chinese young people and what they feel, how they feel, what their life stories. It's all through translation and it's through translation in a very much maneuvered way. And it's translated what is meant and how they express it in Chinese and then how do we actually express it in English. Not just translating these days, especially media and with a Google translation or machine translation, people have a simplistic view of translation or language. We, you know, the way we speak, we communicate, it's actually very intriguing and it's very fascinating. Mm. Human invention is the biggest one is language. It's just because we never speak the way that we literally speaking. Well, it's been good to speak to you today. Oh, thank, thank you, you again for your time. Oh, thank you, Stan. The food additive MSG has long been demonised as unhealthy and possibly dangerous, blamed for everything from headaches to chest pain. But is this myth outdated or even xenophobic? Brendan Wan has more. This is usually the case where I'm not allowed to help. Today, I'm with my parents, cooking up my mum's famous nyuk nyang, a Timorese Chinese meatball dish. My parents were in the restaurant business for over 30 years. I even used to work as a kitchen hand in their Chinese restaurant, Dragonfish. Washing the dishes, I saved enough money to buy our first DVD player. And this was one of their most often used ingredients. Okay, this is MSG in this used Vegemite jar. It basically looks like salt, like flakes of salt or flakes of sugar. And if you taste it, it kind of tastes like uh, instant Ramen broth. Totally salty umami goodness. <laughs> you've probably heard of it, and you've definitely eaten it. MSG, or monosodium glutamate, is a food additive most associated with Chinese cuisine. But even though I grew up eating it, this stuff has a bad reputation. Worse than nicotine, worse than drugs. It's called monosodium glutamate. Migraines, throat swelling, diarrhea, vomiting. But what exactly is MSG? And why does it have such a bad rep? It was first discovered more than 100 years ago 
by Japanese chemist Kikunae Ikeda. He was wondering why his wife's tofu and vegetable soup had such a deep and meaty flavor. She said it was because of its seaweed broth, which Ikeda promptly reduced down to a crystalline powder. Today, MSG can be made through the fermentation of starch, sugarcane, or other ingredients. It's uh, generally used to create flavor, uh, create a sort of a unami flavor, which is uh, uh, savory and meaty. Umami is the fifth recognized type of taste, alongside sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. But the story of how this odorless powder became so demonized started more than 50 years ago. It's a weird story. It's a complicated story. It was a, a letter from uh, Dr. Robert Homan Falk um, to the New England Journal of Medicine in 1968. His letter complained that he had strange symptoms after visiting Chinese restaurants in the US. So originally what happened is the doctors who responded to him in the letters to the editor section, um, they thought he was, he was frankly full of crap. It's really ironic because the doctors and, and his audience treated it like it was nothing. But then news outlets picked up on this story. The New York Times published a story saying MSG was the culprit, citing Dr. Ho Man Kwok's letter as evidence. And so the term Chinese restaurant syndrome was born. It was even adopted in 1993 by the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. But since then, rumors have swirled that MSG can cause sickness, obesity, and even brain damage. Uh, the long-standing myth that MSG, you know, it does a whole range of things to your body it starts from this really weird racist irony. One thing we do know is that its toxicity is quite low, but it does uh, have uh, symptoms. Uh, high intake is associated with, for example, thirst, headache, and numbness of the muscle, especially the neck. The amount needed to produce even mild symptoms like headaches is quite high, up to three grams, whereas the daily average consumption for those that use it is only half a gram. But it only affects uh, uh, those uh, small number of individuals that have high hypersensitivity to MSG, but not to the general population. Still, to this day, the myth around MSG is ingrained in the West, and it's more likely to do with xenophobia than science. Because as long as you have um, Asian people in Western context, uh, particularly Chinese people, um, there's always been racism around food. I don't think MSG is the cause of the racism, but I think it's it's bound up in all of those stereotypes of, oh, Chinese food is foreign, oh, Asian food is dirty. Ironically, MSG is present in all sorts of everyday foods. So if you've ever eaten a Dorito, uh, in a, you know, you've had MSG. A label as a flavor enhancer and bracket uh, MSG or with a number, 621. If you look for that, then you know that those foods contain MSG. So MSG is safe to use. In moderation. Many chefs now agree it actually has an important role to play in enhancing taste. Perfect. Two sources done. MasterChef winner Adam Liao is a known proponent of using MSG. So is Heston Blumenthal. And of course, my two most favorite chefs, mum and dad. Um. Mm. Mm, very struggle. Yeah. Well? Yeah, good. What's it more? Mm. Well, they do say the proof of the pudding is in the eating, and Brendan Wan joins me now here in the studio. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. Uh, look, I've got a little gift for you. Uh, f again, thank you for inviting me to your studio. A little, like, <laughs> a jar of MSG for you. That's from my parents. Just don't use it all at once, right? Definitely isn't not. that Isn't that the trick? All in moderation, please. It, it's really interesting when you hear some of the, the issues that are around MSG and Chinese, Chinese restaurant syndrome. And in the United States, there's a campaign now isn't there to try to change some of those attitudes. That's right, yeah. There's, um, the, Jenny Yang is a comedian who's working with Ajimoto, uh, which is an MSG um, manufacturer, and they're you know, looking to change attitudes surrounding the myth of MSG uh, because you know there is that myth con being conceived that it's you know bad for your health. When in reality, it's all just the flavour enhancement. It's like as healthy as salt and pepper. But you made something a uh, really interesting comment though. There is MSG, and then there is the attitudes that come with it. And you linked it to xenophobia in some cases. So is it first difficult 
to not just look at the health aspects, but the stereotype that comes around it. Yeah, 100%. I mean, the stereotype's been there since, you know, early 1800s, since the gold rush. I mean, the, the, the othering of other, you know, Chinese people's foods. And so, always to change that is very slow. But, I mean, MSG, I feel like it's, it's changing. The attitudes are slowly changing and more and more professional chefs are using it in their, you know, everyday cooking. Mm. It certainly tastes all right to me. Thank you, Brendan. All right, thanks a lot. And that's all for this week and for this season of China Tonight. We'll be back for a special episode in October relating to the National Congress. I'm Stan Grant. Have a great night.